Hello, beloved ones, favored of God, resting in the finished work of our beloved Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, I found three instances. There's many, many more. This is about, uh, oh yes, I'm looking like Madonna, the lucky star video. Um, there are three instances here where scripture is referred to as God's word by Paul, Peter, and Jesus himself confirming that scripture, which would be the Torah, the oracles, like the Psalms and Ecclesiastes, the writings they're called, and the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and so forth, Micah. Uh, they are all inspired by God. I'll give you lots of uh, verses confirming that God, that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that's why you'll see, I believe, 44 different writers in 66 different books written over thousands of years, yet they all work together. And there's a song we sing in church that says, if you find something wrong in the Bible, there's something wrong with you. Uh, it means you're just not reading. First of all, you better have a correct uh, um, translation. Uh, the Latin Vulgate one that the Catholics use, wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, they use words like do penance instead of repent, which if you do penance, that's you working off and paying for your own sins instead of allowing Christ to have done that for us. He who became sin for us who knew no sin, so we might become the righteousness of God in him. So, uh, I'm going to show you three instances where, uh, uh, Jesus and Paul are actually referring to Old Testament scriptures already and showing how they are now fulfilled. Now, there's over 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled just in his uh, life, birth, death, and resurrection. Very, I'm not talking vague Nostradamus stuff where you can just make stuff say whatever you wanted to say. This is, you know, very specific times and dates even down to the exact year where the king, where the Messiah would be proclaimed king by his people, riding in Jerusalem on a donkey, 483 years to the day, okay? And we get the start date to count down to that day by the date that the king of, uh, the Persian king of Babylon gave Nehemiah the okay to begin rebuilding the temple wall. Uh, and Daniel, you'll look at Daniel, and that talks about the 70 weeks of Daniel minus the one prophetic week, leaving you 483 years, because a prophetic week is a seven-year period, okay? Um, so, these are very specific, and, and, and people that say things like, it's just written, it's just written by men, there's flaws in it, I, I, they haven't studied it. They just have it, and I, I don't think it's fair that uh, a person come on, claim that, uh, you know, God's just a tyrant. He's a kid with an ant farm. He doesn't care. He's evil. He's this, and they become the moral judge of God, not understanding what was going on during uh, these tribal fights and the founding of Israel as a set-apart nation for which the Messiah to be born through. Uh, they just don't understand it. So, you know, and this video isn't going to make them understand it either. This is to strengthen the faith of those who are already trusting in Christ. Again, the gospel that saved us on the wall back there, thanks to a beloved viewer that had it painted for me on canvas. Unbelievable. More of a brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the one that saved us, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, fulfilling scriptures according to scriptures. If a man or angel from heaven or anybody preach any other gospel apart from that, his work alone, adding human merit of any kind, let him be accursed. Okay, it's not Jesus plus you doing anything. It's all him, and you either have trusted in him and are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, or you are trusting in yourself. Um, because if it's if it's of works, then it's no longer of grace, all right? The reward's no longer reckoned of grace, but of debt. Christ is dead in vain, and so forth. So, let's look at some things here that confirm. These are just three instances of 
uh, the uh, Jesus and Paul speaking now and then referring to something in the Old Testament, confirming that it's scripture. And then I'll give you verses on how it is God's word. You know, it has to be rightly divided or it'll seem like there's uh, contradictions, but they're not. Uh, a lot of the problem lies where people don't know what they're being saved from. Uh, salvation, is it e eternal salvation? Is it being saved from the consequences of something? Uh, is it is it is it salvation from the nation being destroyed by its enemies? You have to know. Um, so uh, you know everything must be in context. We have to know to whom the book or letter epistle is written uh, and for what purpose. Uh, like First John is written so that our joy may be full. Hebrews is to confirm to the Hebrews. Let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So the whole book of Hebrews is telling the Hebrews that the law can't save them and don't go back to the law trying to offer animal sacrifices because Christ died once for all and there is no more sacrifice for sins. And if you willfully sin by trying to go back to the law, rejecting his shed blood despite the spirit of grace, Ooh, not good. That's what the whole thing's about. Okay, so let's look at these um, Bible verses that confirm things were written hundreds and even thousands of years before, and then they're in fulfillment here. We're going to look at Matthew first. Let's go over to Matthew, uh, I believe it's 2142. Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? Okay, that's him referring to the scriptures, God's word. The headstone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. He's asking him, don't you remember reading this in the Psalms? Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken but on whomsoever it shall fall it will grind him to pieces that's a threat this is about the nation of israel rejecting christ as prophesied king there's god in the flesh standing before them they're they're teachers of the law, and they don't even recognize God standing in front of them. He clearly said before Abraham was, I am. I am that I am, not who I am. I hate it when, those, when people try to uh, grammatically correct God. No, he said, I am that I am. I exist because I exist. I am a self-existing being. I am the Alpha and Omega. You know, they don't get that. I am that I am. You know, before Abraham was, I am. They asked uh, the, the, the guards, the temple guards came when they were looking for him at the Garden of Gethsemane and said, you know, he said, for whom are you looking? And he said, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am. And they all fell down. He didn't say, I am he. The he is italicized. He said, I am. So we know that he is God. And this is him saying, didn't you read in Psalms? Didn't you read it was prophesied in the scriptures that I am that stone? The builders rejected. My own nation has rejected me. The same has become the head of the corner. And it says the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bring, bringing forth fruits thereof. So as he's telling them. We're, we're going to go, I'm going to be offered to strangers, to Gentiles, because my own people, he said, I came but for the lost sheep of Israel, and they rejected him. Now, uh, again, let me remind you, there is no Jew or Gentile in Christ, the body of Christ. There is one new man in Christ Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, because I, I, there's a lot of people that hate Israel and hate the Jews, and that's wrong, too. Okay, it's silly to argue uh, over these vain genealogies. Uh, foolish questions avoid. Okay, that's the best thing for that. Uh, nobody's saved because they are born in the lineage of Abraham. Jesus himself said that God could raise up children from the stones for Abraham if he had to. Okay, but it was a, a holy nation, a set apart nation. Uh, that the Messiah had to be born through. And it was a promise made. And 
and even when we believe not, he abides faithful, can't deny himself. When he makes a promise and a covenant, he keeps it for his own name's sake, okay? So we've heard what he says. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Now let's go over to Psalms 118.21. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. He is our salvation. This is what I get so excited. And once you've trusted in him, you love him, you want to live for him. Like something happens for you when you know you're eternally secure. Nothing's going to, you You can. You can't go to hell if you, you know, bought a ticket and wanted to go. You can't. Because he's kept you, he keeps you, he's begun, begun a good work in you, he's going to complete it. You know, we're unfinished here. He's, he's getting, he's going to finish this. All right. Here's where he confirms what he says in Matthew. The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then let's listen to what Jesus said again. Jesus saith unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of our head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. Let's hear it in Psalms verbatim. The stone which the builders refused has become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. You see, it's so accurate written by probably King David over 750 years before Jesus's birth, okay? And, and, and Jesus is confirming that they are rejecting him and it's all coming to pass. And it goes on in Psalms to say, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That used to be one of my favorite songs by the Bill Gaither Trio when I was a little girl. Remember, this is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad. Do you remember that? It was wonderful. Uh, it says, Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord which has shown us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even into the horns of the altar. Now, uh, what's interesting here is... Um, Jesus says to the Jews, uh, you remember he, he's, he's weeping over Jerusalem. It says, oh, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. And then he threatens them and says, you will not see me again until I hear you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is what it says. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Okay, they were not acknowledging that he is the one who comes in the name of the living God. And then he warns them that the Antichrist would come in his own name and him they would receive. This is going to be one that comes in his own name and him you'll receive. You know, the one from the living God you're rejecting. All right. So now let's go to another example in Luke 4. Um, this, this is Jesus. The Spirit, this is where he's reading Isaiah. And they want to stone him because he's proclaiming, basically, this is fulfilled today. I am the promised Christ. And they try to stone him, but he's so cool, man. You know, he says nobody takes his life. He lays it down for his sheep. It, nobody's going to take it before it's time. That's why I'm sick of people saying the Jews murder. We all murder Jesus because we all sinned and he died for all of us to so stop saying that silly as nobody murdered him. He came to give his life as a ransom for many and nobody took it from him. He even said he could call down legions of angels to stop this. But he said, not my will be done, but, but, but yours, Father. Uh, but in this case, he just walked in the midst of them. Like, they couldn't even see him. He just walked right through him. You know, he's just cool. All right. He said, he's reading, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now, when he's reading this in Isaiah, he stops right before the part of judgment is talked about. Because that part's not yet fulfilled. Okay? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then Jesus says, this day, to, this is fulfilled in your ears, or something like that. 
I didn't, I didn't write, I didn't pull that up, but that's what he says. And they're like, what? what? You're, you're claiming to be the, the Messiah. Isn't he the son of Joseph? They don't even bother to ask, to ask if he was born in Bethlehem. It's just assumed in Galilee, but he wasn't. All right, so now let's look over at Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, it continues on, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. But Jesus didn't continue there. He stopped at to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, period, and sat down and said, this day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your ears. So, uh, he was saying that part's not yet ready, but this is me. I fulfilled it. And that's, you know, when they went a little cuckoo and wanted to kill him. So, once again in Luke, Jesus says this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And then 750 years earlier, actually I said Psalms was 700 something. It was actually a, more than a thousand years earlier they had preached but isaiah that it was written isaiah is actually more than 750 years before jesus's birth and here it is written 750 years before saying the exact same thing that jesus was reading in the synagogue about himself the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. There they go. Now, here's uh, uh, another verse that's in Habakkuk that is mentioned twice by Paul in current scriptures and epistles, okay? But Habakkuk was an Old Testament prophet. Habakkuk 2.4. Remember, he was a, what, what was he, a, a student of G G Gamaliel or something like that? He's like one of the greatest rabbinical teachers there was. The Sanhedrin, he was a Pharisee. Remember, he said, I'm a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. All right, so uh, Habakkuk 2 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Let's read that one more time. We've heard before the just shall live by faith. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Now, we're going to go over, that was the actual prophet. We're going to go to Hebrews and Romans. And most people think that Paul wrote Hebrews. Some people think Peter did. Here we go. Hebrews 10, 38. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, again, the whole book of Hebrews is about that willful sin of rejecting the once for all sacrificial death of Jesus Christ to trample the son of God underfoot to call his blood an unclean thing, despite the spirit of grace, returning to the dead works of the law. Let us not lay again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Now that does not say repentance from sin. Sin is transgression of the law. To repent of sin is to keep the law. And by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, for all who believe, and salvation is for him that worketh not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Why? Because the just shall live by faith. He became sin for us who knew no sin, so we might become the righteousness of God in him by faith. We simply rest in what he, he did for us, as it says in Hebrews, we who have believed have entered into that rest, okay? We have a license to rest, people, not a license to sin. It's so silly. Uh, just because uh, you become God's child, you are born of God by simple trust in what Jesus did for you, which is believing the gospel, and you remain his son forever, no matter what wicked, terrible thing you do, because you will be chastised. You can suffer loss of reward, like in 1 Corinthians 3. You can die early. You will lose testimony, witness, fellowship, all kinds of stuff, but you will never lose salvation. Why? Because salvation is a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift, and people hate it. 
You know, it doesn't mean just because you were forever going to be saved, no matter what, because you've trusted in Christ. He writes his laws on your hearts. So you're going to be chastised. He does not judge us. Uh, uh, he doesn't judge us at the end like those who don't believe. It says the Holy Spirit will come and convict us of righteousness. All of us who have right standing with God. We're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Of sin, the world of sin, because they would not believe. And of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So it tells you that. All right? We've got to get this straight. We get saved by rest and become just as we are to God. The gospel, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We come to him. We go, you died for me. You were buried. You rose again on the third day. Your standard is perfection, and I can't reach it. I fall short. All have. Okay? And so I'm going to look to you and what you did for me on the cross for salvation. And that's it. Now, uh, if you continue to live, and because it says grow in his grace through the milk of the word. Well, if you never grow in spiritual maturity, uh, you have all kinds of terrible consequences, you know. But it's not loss of salvation. Eternal life really is a free gift. It's great news. And it, until you get this and have really trusted in Christ and realized how secure you are, you, you, you don't want to do that. Like something just happens. It just. It's not all right anymore. It doesn't feel right. I feel grieved, you know, even thinking about doing some of that. But you're 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 going to struggle against the flesh like forever. I mean, we all do. I, I really just want people to get this. All right. Now, again, Habakkuk is talking about how the just shall live by faith, you know, because without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, in Hebrews, it confirms it. Now, the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Draw back from what? Draw back from God's grace through faith into the law. Because he's talking to Hebrews. If we sin willfully after that, we see the, we receive the knowledge of the truth. There remains no more sacrifice for sins. Now, I'm so sick of these people using that verse. See, if you sin on purpose willfully, you used up the blood of Jesus. Nope, no more sacrifice for sins. That is the stupidest, worst, out of context verse. And the, the book of Hebrews should give you security and joy about how Christ died once for all. And he's perfected forever them that are sanctified. Sanctified means declared holy, uh, set apart by God for God. By his blood, freely by his grace, you're sanctified by his blood. Remember he said, such were some of you, but ye were washed, justified, sanctified, okay? Because it's God who does it all. He gets all the glory, people. That's the good news of the gospel. So it tells you, now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You don't want to go back to the law. Look at Romans. He's talking about the just living by faith. All right, Romans 1.17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Habakkuk says it in 2.4. Hebrews 10.38 confirms that his soul won't have any pleasure in you if you don't live by faith. And then Romans 1.17 tells you that the righteousness of God himself is revealed from faith to faith. Because it's written... In the Old Testament, remember it says you, you look to the scriptures, Jesus says, and in them you think you have eternal life. Meaning you think you can find salvation by doing works of the law. What the, He says, what works might I do that I have eternal life? This is the work of God to believe on he whom he sent. Okay, it tells you what the work is. And then he's telling you right here that righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it's written in Habakkuk. The just shall live by faith. Okay, so these are things that are confirmed, written hundreds, even thousands of years before they occurred. And then they're re-mentioned uh, by uh, uh, prophets and the Lord himself later on using uh, those verses. It, it's, it's absolutely divinely written. It really is God's word. Let's get some uh, verses on uh, scripture here. Hebrews 4.12, 
For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, this amazes me. I, I did a video the other day. Uh, keep uh, Jan Boshoff, the final call 07, in your prayers. Apparently, he's a very sick man or he has cancer. I pray he's well. I never did anything to anyone and, and insulted their character. But the man tells you overt heresy to stay away from the Bible because it can't be the word of God because Jesus is the word of God. Well, Jesus is the living word, but the Bible is God's written word. And it's very important to uh, not stay away from the Bible. It's, I mean, that's how we discern and test the spirits. It's uh, it's the sword of the spirit of how we fight the enemy. Uh, Jesus fought the devil using the word of God quoted uh, at Satan. So it's really silly to say that the Bible is idolatry. So I had to speak against it. And in that video, I gave you tons of verses uh, where God's word itself clearly tells you it's God's word and why it's God's word. Uh, nevertheless, there's tons of prophecies that were fulfilled and that should show you that is a, a supernatural book okay also it says it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart when someone reads scripture and all they see is god's wrath and sin it shows you what they're focused on they glory in the flesh their view of god is that he's just you know uh mean and wrathful and they don't see grace anywhere Instead of where sin abounds, grace did much more abound. They see where sin abounds, uh, grace diminishes, and it's squeezed, and you're going to get crushed under God. And no wonder there's so many atheists. If that's the God you're presenting him, our Father loved us so much that he gave his only begotten Son. All we do is believe in him, put our trust in what he did for us, and we'll never perish but have everlasting, eternal life. That's amazing good news, amazing grace. I, I don't know what happened with this gospel, how it got so convoluted. He said, I marvel you're so soon removed from he who called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there'd be some that come in and trouble you and would pervert the gospel. You know, he says, I marvel you're so soon removed from the simplicity. That's in Christ. And Paul tells you, I come to you knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. Because he knew the works of the law and he counted it all dung. It was worthless. Couldn't save him. But uh, Jesus flat out said, you, you, you seek the scriptures and in them you think you have eternal life. But they are which testify of me. Okay. All of those prophets, the law, all fulfilled. He has uh, um, uh, taken away the enmity written in the ordinances against us, written in stone, okay? The enmity that was against us in the Ten Commandments has been removed because Christ not only took the wrath for us breaking God's perfect, holy, just law that none of us could keep enough to be perfect, just, and holy, but he fulfilled that law. He said not one jot or tittle will be removed till it be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled you see that's why christ is the end of the law for righteousness for all who believe because he fulfilled the law on our behalf uh just through the uh failure of one the sinning of one man adam all die all perish through one man's obedience christ jesus obedience all can live we just simply rest in him it's his righteousness his obedience it's like they think adam's more powerful than jesus or something uh, so anyway, I've been rambling on. I've, it's a long video. All right, Second Timothy. So anyway, that gives you the thoughts and discerning of their heart, doesn't it? They don't see grace anywhere. Second Timothy three sixteen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. I also heard that gentleman we were discussing say, "Well, some is the Word of God and some of it's not. It's just written by men." Oh, so you just pick and choose. He takes out the part about grace. And then all the parts that seem to imply the standards for being a disciple, like pick up your cross and follow me and all of that stuff, which is about his earthly ministry, warning them that they could even, you know, lose their very lives. Uh, he didn't even half-hearted people. Uh, they'll, you know, they'll pick and choose what they think is God's word. And then what they don't understand, they take out and say, oh, no, 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 it was written by man. Or Paul's not a real apostle. Or who are you going to believe, Jesus or Paul? But 
Paul said that he didn't receive it of man, nor was he taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. So Paul's words are Jesus's words. All right. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Even if the mail's not written directly to you, if it's written to Israel, not directly to the church, it's still profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It just has to be read in context. Just like when Paul says, you know, the law is good if it you if it's used properly, if it's used lawfully. See, you're not going to come and bring the law into the gospel and say you must repent of your sin or keep the law. The same thing as sin is transgression of the law. Uh, you must repent of your sin uh, and believe Jesus died and rose again. No, that's the law plus the gospel, but it's not the gospel. He said uh, it's not another. You know, there's only one gospel that saves you. So you use the law lawfully. It's good. It's good, perfect, just, holy, righteous. But it can't make you perfect, just, righteous, and holy. Okay? Only uh, the blood of Christ can and his uh, imputed righteousness. Here we go. Uh, Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Proverbs 420, my son, attend to my words, incline thy ear unto my sayings. Proverbs 35 through 6, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Uh, and that, that's two things. Uh, Jesus is the word and he is our shield. Uh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was was God. Now that's Jesus, God's word, living word. Um, now, let's see, Psalms 119, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let's see, Isaiah 40, 8, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand for ever. John 12, 48, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. All right, so there's so many verses on God's word, but I wanted to show you just those three examples of how they were used uh, and referred back to in the Old Testament. It tells you in John 17, thy word is is truth john 6 68 then simon peter answered him lord he says are you guys going to leave too because he was saying some hard stuff hard to hear i believe it was some of you if you don't drink my blood and eat my flesh you have no part of me they're like whoa it's too hard to hear that was his flesh is flesh that was spirit is spirit they couldn't they couldn't hear these spiritual truths you know like paul said i come to you as carnal you know because uh, you can't you're not spiritual then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And then John tells us, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I told you what begotten meant. It isn't the old English word begotten like to have a sexual union and create. Begotten in this sense is like God gave his only begotten son. It means without equal, without peer, completely one of a kind. Okay, that's what that means. All right, uh, I wanted to give you some stuff on the word of God again. And you can check out the video I did on the Bible. But uh, there's a few examples of why we stand on God's word and why it is the supernatural book. All right, you guys. God bless you.